and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you give us to give back just a portion of what you've blessed us with, Lord God. Father, you've blessed us so much, oh Lord God. Father, you've blessed us so much. And God, we just give back, oh Lord God, just... Lord Jesus, a part of it, Lord God, to acknowledge you, to acknowledge your grace, to acknowledge your provision, to acknowledge that everything comes from you, Lord God. We pray that you would bless and multiply, God, this offering. And God also, Lord Jesus, uh, for those that are in need, oh God, Lord, you're more than enough, oh Lord God. I pray that you would supply for every need that's represented here and those that are watching at home, because you are faithful, Lord. And Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you may come and collect our tithes and offerings. Amen. You know, we've been reading in the book of Genesis the story of Joseph. And uh, as I was praying, the Lord dropped a word in my heart about the reason everything happened in Joseph's life from a very young man over a process of uh, a good number of years. And I was thinking about, you know, things as I've learned, and my wife and I, as many of you know, are new grandparents. We uh, have little Gabriel in our lives now, and we get to watch him sometimes and when, the, when Timmy and Faith are in the young adults we get them that evening to watch him all night. And this, uh, the most important thing that we need to know when they give us Gabriel, there's one thing that they can't leave us without. And that's the bottles. We got to make sure that there's enough bottles. He drinks his mother's milk, and uh, so it's not like we can go out and get Similac or something like that. So we say, do we have enough bottles? Why? Because he, he has like an, a switch, like he's fine and he's laughing. And then when that switch goes off, it's like the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> Once that hunger kicks in, he wants his bottle. And we need to be able to satisfy the baby's hunger Otherwise, things won't go too well in the house. It's amazing how a little baby can turn everything upside down. In the same way that it's important, not only for babies, for people to eat healthy food to stay alive, it's the same way with our spiritual health. We cannot survive if we're not taking in spiritual food. In Joseph's day... There was a seven-year famine coming, and God made it so that his chosen people would survive, would survive that famine. I want to talk to you about spiritual famine this evening, because I've been thinking a lot about that. The first thing that God put on my heart was that we need to be aware that there's a famine in the land. We need to be aware that there's a famine in the land. A spiritual famine has not only come to this country, I don't know if you've noticed it or not. We've gotten so far away from God that we're purposely pushing him out. Uh, I heard somebody in Congress during a hearing say that Congress is not concerned about God's will. It's not their concern. But it's not only this country, but also Christians in this country who are experiencing a spiritual famine. 
Uh, prayer meetings like this are not the usual or not the norm. A lot of churches don't have a prayer meeting. And you know why they don't have one? You know why? Because people won't come. People won't come to pray. Amos 8.11, in a prophecy that God gave to the prophet Amos, says this, The time is surely coming, says the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. A time is coming, the Lord says. And I believe that time is now. I believe that time has come. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read the following in the first five verses. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. That day is here. I just described what's going on in society. But forget society. Our, our concern is the people of God, right? Because judgment always begins in, in the house of the Lord. So there's a famine, first of all, of prayer. Even though 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us never stop praying. They should add, uh, there should not be another verse that says, why don't you start praying? <laughs> Forget about stopping. Some people haven't started. Some churches haven't started praying. Even, uh, um, you know, us, we were doing uh, more with more people praying before the pandemic, and now people are coming back. But the prayer meeting uh, should be the most well-attended meeting of a church. It really should. Ever since the day that we started, uh, over five years ago, We've always said, and you hear ad nauseum on Sundays, that the most important meaning of our church is when? Tuesday. But it's like pulling teeth to get people to pray. Thank God for all of you and those of you that join us online that pray, but a lot of people don't. And uh, you know what? I'm not going to stop. I don't care if I'm here by myself. I'm going to come here and pray. There's a famine of prayer. And prayer is the lifeblood of our relationship with God. There's no relationship with God without prayer. Absolutely none. It's a myth, right? Just like there's no relationship if I never talk to you. If I, if I, if I say, hey, you know what? Me and Brother James, we're good friends. But I never talked to him. Would you believe me? Is that a relationship? But we do talk, don't we, brother? All the time. All the time. Because there's a relationship. That's the proof of a relationship. Amen? That's the lifeblood of our relationship with God. It's also how we make room for God to speak into our hearts and to correct us. Some people don't pray because they don't want to be corrected. I know about that at a certain time in my life. Ooh, I don't want to, what will you say? Why? Because you're not doing the right thing, right? Otherwise, if you want to do the right thing, you want to hear if there's anything in there. That's what David's prayer was all about. 
Search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Because you know what? Sometimes we don't know. Isn't that something? There could be a wicked way in us, and we're like, huh? What? We need God to show us. Amen? Prayerlessness indicates that we are relying on our own strength. Did you know that? Someone who doesn't pray, they're not relying on God's strength because you're not going to have it. You're relying on your own. If you don't pray, then you're not seeking God's direction for your life either. You're just doing your own thing because you're not going to hear from God if you don't pray. It's like you're saying, I got this. Lots of luck with that. If you don't pray, you're not even thinking about bringing glory to God with your life. Amen? There's a famine of prayer. And we really got to pray, folks. We really do. We really do. We got to bear in and pray. Those of you that have a hunger for prayer and have been, God has opened your heart to pray, you got to encourage folks to come out and pray. Because the strength of this church or any church, and by the way, I'm not talking about uh, um, a numbers thing as far as people are concerned. I'm talking about to see God move and people's lives changed here in this location. Not You can have a, 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 a church full of people, like there are many places like that, but there's no prayer and there's no change in people's lives. I was a part of two large churches, and I know that when people don't pray, there is no growth. There is no fruit at all. But to get people to pray, ooh, even though it, it, that's the riches of heaven. That's how you make contact with all the riches of heaven. Amen? There's also a famine for hunger for the word of God. The Bible says the, 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 the word of God is active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's how it, it judges the thoughts and, 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 and the attitudes of the heart. And if we, we don't ha have a hunger for God's word, how is how's our attitude going to be changed? How are our thoughts going to be cleansed? If we don't meditate and spend time in the Word of God, there's no hunger for that. You know, people should be running to the Bible studies to study the Word of God. That's a joy. But I guess there's more important things to do. There's a famine of desire to gather as God's people. That's all over the place. Uh, the, the, the percentages are not going up of people going to church. They're going down. And I think uh, the pandemic just hastened a lot of the pe people that were loosey-goosey with it anyway. They just kind of said, ah, that's it, I'm done. To the tune of, uh, what is it, 30%. Are no longer attending even online. Even online. The Bible says with good reason don't forsake the gathering of yourselves as God's people. There's a famine of holiness. That's a thing of the past, that's old fashioned. But a little problem for everybody that's not worried about that. Hebrews chapter 12 says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But holiness is old-fashioned. What's in now is, hey, you know what? God is good. Uh, you know, he's loving he won't, doesn't want me not to have fun, and I'm a sinner anyway. He understands that, so just live life the way you want, and at the end, you know, I'll go to heaven. But that doesn't jive with God's word, and I have to tell the truth that without holiness, no one will see God. 
There's a famine of holiness. There's also a famine of belief. I remember Jesus saying that he wouldn't do or couldn't do many miracles in his hometown because of tremendous unbelief. He was amazed at it. He was, I can't believe how people don't believe. He was amazed, the Bible says, in Mark chapter 6. So we have to be aware that's a famine in the land. Why do we have to be aware? You know, when Joseph, uh, I should say Jacob, Jacob the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Abraham's grandson, when he saw that there was a famine in the land, he became aware of it. And because he became aware of it, he was able to start to do something about it. What did he do? He sent his sons to where there was food. He sent them to get food so that they wouldn't die. But if he wouldn't have been aware of it, if he would have said, ah, this will pass, we'll wait this out, there would have been no people of God. So you have, if you're not aware that there's a famine, you won't do anything. You'll just stay right where you are doing nothing. And you won't get proactive about doing something about a famine. So what do you do when there's a famine? What do you do as a follower of Christ? You buy food at no cost during the famine. I love the fact that when the brothers went back to uh, uh, Egypt, and they met up with Joseph. They didn't knew, know it was Joseph because it had been 13 years. They didn't recognize him. He was now a grown man, not a 17-year-old. And they had money to purchase the food. And when they went back with the grain and they opened up their sacks, their money was there in the sack. They got a little scared. Oh, no, they're going to think we stole the food, but the money had been put back. And the second time, it happened the same way. They were buying grain without money. And that's a type of what we read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 to 3. It says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. The Lord is not talking about physical food here. You know that, right? He's calling his people to come and get nourished with the only thing that can nourish your spirit and your soul, with the things of God. Amen? Because we do spend emotional and the wrong kind of spirit money on things looking to be satisfied in this world where nothing satisfies, nothing at all. You can try it all. What did you ever get that you didn't get tired of after just a short while? What did you ever handle or acquire that satisfied deep inside your heart? What? Solomon tried it. Read Ecclesiastes again if you haven't read it in a while. What didn't he have? Not what did he have, what didn't he have? What didn't he try? You name it, even with relationships. Try a thousand. I would have loved to have been his marriage counselor. I would have stayed busy just with one client. And he says it was all like chasing after the wind. You can't catch it. You never can catch it because you're buying the wrong kind of food. Jesus, backing that up, declaring who he was in John 6, 35, says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So how do you do that? How do you buy food? Be sober and alert. Don't fall asleep. Be awake. See what's going on. And be prayerful. Be prayerful. Be prayerful. Get people to come and pray with us on Tuesday night. But pray at home as well. Both are important. You can't just pray here and then not pray in your private life. And it's not good just to pray and be your own lone ranger and, and not come and gather and pray with God's people. They're both necessary. Study and meditate God's word. We give you a big help with that, with the Bible studies. We, we have a wonderful time discovering God's word. And then stay consistently connected with other Christians. That's called church. You know, I don't know if this is so important that you need to know. You cannot, listen, I'm going to make a very, very strong statement here. You cannot stay grounded or you cannot ground yourself by yourself. As a Christian, you cannot be grounded unless you are in a family. Right? Everybody here comes from a family. In other words, when, when and Timmy and Faith had Gabriel, they didn't just put him outside and say, okay, hope you make it. Goodbye. Right? He was meant to be in a family, to be nurtured and to grow and, and, and to be a family together and to go through things together. Some people don't realize the importance of the church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ, not just this local church. Any church that preaches Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the gospel according to the Bible, that's the church of the living God. Amen? But you cannot be grounded unless you are part of a local body. People who don't know that, listen, the letters, who are they to in Scripture? Who are the letters to? To the churches. Jesus said, love your wife like Christ loved what? The church. Not an organization. Not uh, some para church thing, the church. In Revelation, where is Jesus going back forth in, in the lampstand? Where? To the church. Church is important. I'm not talking about church like we know it. Oh, Sunday, it's church. No, I'm talking about the family. That we are a family. We're not just, this building is not the church. We're the church. And it's important to be in the church is a part of the church, is a vital part of the church, not dropping in and out whenever you feel. We're supposed to know each other. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to pray and encourage one another. I made a lot of stupid mistakes growing up. But there's one I didn't make. I've never left the church. And it became my lifeline in a very, very difficult season for me where I, where I was, went haywire for, for reasons that God knows about. But I, the, the church was my lifeline. God reached me there through his presence. Amen? And lastly... Buying food also is being filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can live a godly life. Do you ever pray for God to fill you with his, with his Holy Spirit? I pray that all the time. I pray it all the time. Lord, fill, I love to be filled with God's uh, Spirit. I love for him. I love that verse. I preached about it a few Sundays ago. My life is hidden with Christ and God. That's what I want every day. My life is hidden with Christ and God. Oh, what about you? Oh, I live fine. When my life is in with Christ and God. Just don't let me out of that, because then I'll go nuts. Keep me safe in there. 
In Jesus. That's where I'm safe and where I have my best life. Amen? Amen. Timmy, if you'd come. So you have to be aware that there's a famine. How many know that there's a famine in the land? Then you can buy food at no cost. By being alert, being prayerful, honoring the word and staying consistently connected to a local body and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Finally, you need to seek God so that he will strategically place you in a position for good during the famine. When you seek the Lord, right, during a famine, you are strategically positioned for God to do good during the famine, just like he strategically put Joseph as second in command to Pharaoh. What a beautiful plan he had. In Genesis 45, 6 and 7, here's what Joseph said. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping, but God has sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God sent Joseph ahead of his family, of his brothers and sisters, of everybody that was in the land, the servants of Jacob and everybody else, to preserve and saved their lives through a great deliverance. Then there was Jesus, right? And we read about the time that he fed the 5,000. That was, he was teaching a lesson there. It was not about, oh, let's get people some bread and some fish. It was not about that. He was teaching his disciples, his followers, a lesson. We read in Mark 6, starting in verse 35, It says this, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. God wants you to give people something to eat. There's a famine in the land. People are literally dying and going to hell all around us. And he's telling you and me, since we have the food, the only food that can nourish a soul, you and, you and I have it, don't we? How many agree? If you have it, raise your hand. Well, you might say, it's only a little that I have. That's what that story is all about. What do you have in your hand? What do you have? How much bread do you have? How much food do you have? You only have a little bit. You consider yourself not that much. You can't do much. I don't speak well. Or you have whatever else. You want to believe about yourself or whatever else the enemy is telling you? All you got to do is place what you have in the hands of Jesus and you can feed as many as there are. That's the way it is. This is important. Remember Peter, who was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. And we know that he denied Jesus three times. He was following him from a distance, felt horrible, ran away when Jesus looked at him when they had arrested Jesus. Then, I guess feeling sorry for himself and thinking, I'll go back to fishing. They went fishing, he went fishing, and Jesus appeared on the shore. You remember the story. And that's when Jesus restored him. But it's interesting what he said to him. In John chapter 21, verse 15, we read this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. That that wasn't a call to a preacher. 
He was a disciple. We know that he went on to become an apostle. We know that. But when he called him that, he was a disciple. And he was telling Peter, if you love me, you will feed my lambs. God has positioned you somewhere. Wherever you are, you're a son or a daughter of God with the treasure of the gospel in your possession with an inheritance that can't spoil, fade, or wrinkle. You have the keys of life because Jesus gave them to you. We have eternal life. So he's not waiting for me to tell everybody as a pastor. He's waiting for you. He's positioned you. There are places that you are, are and are going where I could never or I will never go. I don't even know. You know how important what God has given each one of us is. And if you're willing, he will open the doors for you. Even if you're shy about that kind of thing. Even if you're not a, a, an extrovert. Amen. God has placed us strategically in this area. We got to get to work, folks, so that people that are dying in the famine will hear that there's grain somewhere. <laughs> there's food somewhere. There's food somewhere. And they can come and buy food without cost. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you, O oh God, and we hear your word tonight. Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that we're living in a very, very different kind of time, Lord God. A lot of things have happened, Lord, and like your word says, people's love for you and for your word is growing cold. But Lord, we're not going to shrink back. Lord God, we believe this, Lord God. That, Lord, as your Shekinah glory rests on this place and on every place, O oh Lord God, that is declaring the name of Jesus and preaching the gospel and loving you and loving others, O oh God. Lord, that your Shekinah glory would draw people, O oh Lord God. Lord, I pray, O oh Lord God, that there would be something God, about the places where we're meeting that would draw people that don't know you, God, that are dying in the famine that's in the land, oh God. And that they would come in, Father, and find plenty of food, oh Lord God, without cost. And that, Lord, those that are not coming to the building will be reached by those that have come here, oh Lord God, and in other churches, oh God, that preach the gospel. That it would be us, your people, oh Lord God drawing people and bidding them to come and eat. Oh, Lord God, without cost, Lord Jesus. Father, we need you. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord God. God, wake us up, oh, Lord God, to the strategic place where you've placed us, where we can do a lot of good, Lord God, according to the kingdom of God. Lord, wake us up. Stir up the gifts within us, Lord Jesus. So that, Father, we can be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, just like your word says that we are. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can we gather together in groups of three or four and just pray for one another? Ask God to help us. Ask God to help us to be that, to be hope in a famine, to be uh, to point to Jesus in the famine, to point and people to the one who is the bread of life, that God will wake us up, that we won't fall asleep. Let's pray and encourage one another for a few moments and pray together. Let's do that right now.